Well, thank you, Melissa, and thanks to the organizers uh, for providing an opportunity for uh, the Canadian Institute for Health Information uh, to share uh, some of the information we have with you today. Uh, and my colleague, Cal Marcou, will be speaking a bit later in the day on privacy and security. Um, so as you'll see, there's a, a lot going on at the organization. So the Canadian Institute for Health Information, uh, refer to it as CHI-HI. There'll be a couple of other acronyms. Uh, I'll spell them out uh, before using them, but CHI-HI is, is the organization overall. <clears throat> what I'm going to talk about, um, I, know, I know you spent in, with day one a focus on the concepts of value-based care and types of projects that might make sense, and towards the end of the day today, you'll be talking more about uh, strategy and what things you may want to focus on. And then Andre uh, led off this morning with some, some important information as well. What I'm going to spend most of the time on is on data, data and opportunities there, and some of the lessons learned that we have as an organization in terms of the partners we're working with uh, on collecting data in the area of uh, patient reported information. <clears throat> Before I get started though, I just want to give you uh, all a little bit of background on the organization. Um, so we are funded by the federal, provincial, and territorial levels of government. Uh, we're a not-for-profit organization. As Melissa mentioned, we're also independent. Um, what that means is that the data we collect is to support the goals of the healthcare system, and we also release statistics on the performance of the healthcare system and the health of Canadians. And the independent feature that we have is that <coughs> Governments, although they fund us, they don't have the power to veto what we release. So if we're showing that certain aspects of health care are not doing so well, similar to Statistics Canada, they really want the facts out, out there. Um, and we're one of the few success models of federal, provincial, territorial cooperation. Um, and I think in large part that independence is, um, is key to our success, as is the trust that we hold um, across Canada in terms of our safe management of, of sensitive health data. Uh, we've been in existence about 25 years. We're coming up to our 25th uh, anniversary shortly. Um, and the reason the governments have funded us is they were having too many squabbles in their policy discussions around the data and what, what was true, so they couldn't get on to debating which policies. So that's where CHI-HI fits into the healthcare landscape, is we provide, that in, we provide the data and also the independent statistics through which policies can be debated. Uh, our vision is better data, better decisions, and healthier Canadians. Um, and really the decisions, some are made by CHI-HI, but most of them are made by the people across Canada that use our data every day. <clears throat> we have a strategic plan that guides what we do. Um, and um, we have three goals on this. It's focused on data standards and having high quality data. Our second goal, which is in the middle, is focused on analytical tools, so making it easier for people to use the data, uh, and in particular on the healthcare system, and then producing what we call actionable analysis, so reports that people can take action on to achieve health system goals. On the right-hand side of this screen, you'll see we've also identified several priority themes. Uh, in the upper right is the health system performance themes, um, which focus on patient experience, quality and safety, outcomes, which also includes patient reported outcomes, and value for money, which is um, a term that very much relates to the value-based healthcare that uh, is the focus of this event. And the most exciting developments are when you have data on all four of those themes and you can connect them. Um, because as we know, it's, it's of little value if, if the healthcare system can save 30%, but patient outcomes or patient experiences or both are much worse. What really um, is at the heart of value-based care, is, as you've already heard, is wanting to get the best possible experiences and outcomes for the lowest possible cost. So having being able to connect those. We also have several priority populations, uh, seniors and aging, mental health and addictions, First Nations, uh, Inuit and Métis, children and youth, 
And these are in addition to all the other regular reporting uh, areas that we, we tackle. You'll see on our strategic plan, uh, just on the years, we're midway through the five-year strategic plan. Um, so we're focusing in on what we can finish between now and the end of the plan and also starting to prepare for what types of things we should focus on uh, for the subsequent five years. <clears throat> so as an organization, um, one of the things that we're best known for, and I would say uniquely positioned for in, across Canada, is the data that we hold. And we, we help the country collect this data, and we also um, ensure it's high quality and it's safe management. Um, we use it for our own reporting purposes, but a key role we play is we disseminate the data to trusted users across the country. Uh, people running ministries of health, health regions, researchers, many other groups make use of the data. Some of the data that we're best known for is the hospital and emergency department care data. So we have, whenever someone stays in hospital overnight across Canada, we have what's called an abstract of, of their stay, uh, which is just a subset of information in terms of when they were admitted, what conditions they had, uh, when they were discharged, uh, where they were discharged to, if they were admitted by ambulance, et cetera. And all this data is codified according to ICD-10, which is an international classification. And then um, we also enrich the data. We do things which are called uh, add risk adjustment variables. So you can do more comparisons with the data across the country. Um, the emergency department data is also very important and we have uh, quite good coverage on that. We have some mental health data and that's growing. Uh, home care and long-term care, quite a bit of data there and it's growing. All this data is at a record level, uh, but we don't get patient names. We get uh, what's the health card number, and then that comes into Chi High so it can be linked up, and then it's all de-identified before it's analyzed. That way it protects um, the safety of the data, but allows the analysis to be done. And really that's the only way that you can have the detailed level data that's needed to answer some of the complex questions. We have data on physicians and physician billing. We also have data on rehabilitation practices, pharmaceuticals, publicly funded pharmaceuticals. Um, I'll talk about the middle column, the patient reported data in a minute. Uh, before we get there though, on the right column, you'll see there's information on health spending. This is where we have a lot of patient costing information. We also do what are called case mix groupers, um, which uh, are ways of seeing costs of length of stay for similar types of patients uh, and physician billing data as well and some other health system costs. Uh, the reason these two columns are so important is if you want to do value-based care, you need the outcomes data, some of which comes from the clinical data holdings, some comes from patient reported. You need the costing data and then you need the patient experiences data. <clears throat> So it's only in recent years that the country has identified the need to fill in the data gaps on patient reported data. Um, so for the past three or four years, Chi High has been trying to address those gaps with partners across the country. So there are two types of patient reported data that I'll speak about. The first is called PREMS, and it's patient reported experience measures. So when you hear PREMS, and these slides will be available, um, but just remember that in PREMS, the E is experience. And the experience is for someone who had a healthcare visit, what was their experience on that? Did they feel they had good communication? They received the information they needed? Uh, the healthcare facility they were in felt safe and clean? A number of other factors. <clears throat> the other patient reported information that we'll be talking about um, is patient reported outcome measures. So the focus for this, and this acronym is called PROMS. So just like going to the prom when you finish up at high school. Uh, and the O is for outcomes. So PREMS experience for outcomes and PROMS um, O for outcomes. The focus here is on change. So how much benefit did you, the patient receive for the healthcare intervention that they had? So a common example is someone who has a hip or knee replacement um, or they need one. They're in excruciating and debilitating pain. Um, they go to their, their 
uh, family physician who sends them off to an orthopedic surgeon. <clears throat> it's deemed that they should benefit from this uh, hip replacement surgery. So ideally, if that surgery is successful, it will reduce pain, <clears throat> improve their functioning, and their overall quality of life. So what PROMS do is they measure the health, the patient's health state from the patient's perspective before the intervention, and then at an agreed upon time point after the intervention. So in the example of a hip replacement, usually you would wait one year, because uh, that's when you would expect the patient has reached the maximum benefit uh, from that surgery. Um, so PROMS has that pre and post component, whereas PREMS is usually just measured once very shortly after the visit when the experience is fresh in the, the patient's mind. <clears throat> as an organization as well, I would say um, in, uh, we're just now turning our attention to having more patient involvement in what we're doing. We recognize the importance of uh, having a patient-centered healthcare system and that Kai High plays a role in that. And as an organization, we don't interact with patients in terms of the care that they receive, but we recognize, given our role in the healthcare system, we need to be aware of um, how best to support patient-centered health system goals and also look at our, our practices as an organization and make sure that we're getting patients involved in the right ways. So with that in mind, we're developing a patient-centered uh, strategy for the organization, and we for us, it's early days, so we're on the learning curve with this, um, and we're getting, putting some thought to are there certain advisory committees that we should have patients involved in, or if we're developing a new report, uh, one we released this year was focused on dementia, so there was some patient engagement around that topic uh, that was quite helpful in terms of what types of things should be emphasized in the report, what patient stories would be included, and also with some of the media coverage, ensuring that patients uh, played a role in that. Um, and this slide just highlights a number of questions where the PREMS, the patient experience data and the outcomes data are important to a range of stakeholders across the healthcare system. So I'll just let you read those uh, while I get a, a sip of water. Okay, so I'll now move into the, um, the PREMS and PROMS focus of the, of the discussion. Um, and you can see on this slide, uh, the PREMS and PROMS are shown as overlapping because they're seen to be interrelated. So if you want a high performing healthcare system, you want to ensure you have good scores on the PREMS and also on the PROMS. And both of these are embedded in our patient oriented strategy. There are a number of <clears throat> people at Kai High that spend uh, part of their day focused on the PREMS and PROMS. Um, so there's quite a bit of activity going on at Kai High in this area. Uh, and just want to acknowledge all the, the individuals involved in the work here. Um, and our work, uh, we've engaged patients in a number of ways, survey development, data collection, patient stories, health system capacity building, and uh, other activities. And uh, the work on PREMS and PROMS, um, I highlighted Kai Hai's role in terms of data, but one of the other key things that we do, and I think it's relevant for your group in particular, is standards. So one of the key values Kai Hai plays is that when things, similar things are going on across the country, what we can often do is bring those groups together so that they can take a common approach to solving the same problem. Uh, what this, this gives two benefits. The first is it can be more efficient for them uh, to get, achieve their local goals. Um, but the biggest value is that by having data that's comparable across the country and from other sites, you can then do benchmarking, not just locally, how you're doing over time, but how are you doing or how is the system doing in, in one area compared to another similar area. And that's one of the things that we're best known for is public and private reporting on how the healthcare system is doing and making those comparisons. Um, so standards is important. If you go down the road of PREMS or PROMS, you want to take a think about how you approach a standards. <coughs> 
then there's data collection, and then there's also how the data is reported, so it's meaningful and constructive. And then building capacity across the system for people that could benefit from the data to be able to use it. Uh, so I'll now spend a few minutes talking about the PREMS activities that Kai Hai has been involved in in the last few years. Um, it has, <clears throat> excuse me, a bit of an acute care, it does have an acute care focus, but we recognize that this can expand over time. Um, so in 2011, several provinces and territories were collecting their own patient experience data. Uh, but it wasn't comparable. They were going off in different directions. Um, and they approached Kaihai to see if we could develop a Canadian a standardized patient uh, uh, PREMS survey, uh, starting with acute care, recognizing that you can't tackle the whole system at once. So we started with the inpatient care. Um, so Kaihai convened a national group of stakeholders to develop that survey. Um, and as a result, um, we have now, there is a now a standardized patient experience survey. It's called the Canadian Patient Experiences Survey in Patient Care. Uh, that's available on our website if you would like to take a look at it. It's modeled on the U.S. Uh, PREM survey called HCAPS. So it has about 22 questions from the U.S. survey. There are 19 additional questions from the Canadian context, some questions on demographic information, and it's all been pilot tested um, for use in both English and French in uh, the Canadian setting. So that development of that resource took some time, lots of discussion, but we're very pleased with the survey and it is seen as a, a new international standard. <clears throat> and someone who's collecting PREMS data in Canada in acute care should use this survey. There's no need to go off and develop their own. If you're developing complementary PREM surveys, you might want to look at the questions here and borrow some of the questions uh, from, from the survey and it's available free, uh, it's in the public domain. Uh, some of the th themes that are covered in the survey are admission and discharge experience, information provided during admission and discharge, communication with care providers, responsiveness of staff, uh, pain control, sense of coordination, in patient involvement and in decision making, timeliness of testing, emotional support, physical environment, and then overall global ratings uh, for the survey. Uh, this is just a snapshot of what the survey looks like. It's, there's no magic to it. It's just like a questionnaire that we've all filled out many variations of questionnaires over the years. Um, but as an example, <clears throat> their uh, patients asked the question and they would respond never, sometimes, usually, or always. So there's a four-point scale here and it forces people to pick a positive or a negative response. Uh, because what you don't want is everyone picking neutral because then it, it really it isn't as sensitive to change. What happens with these surveys in acute care is... Um, and it's applied, there's a complex sampling methodology that's applied to medical and surgical and maternal patients. But several, within several weeks of discharge from hospital, they're contacted either by phone, email, or mail, um, and asked to complete the survey, and it's sent in, and it's all managed confidentially. And then it's, <clears throat> it's collected locally and then sent back into Kaihai. So I mentioned we just started this in 2011, just started the discussions around having a survey or not. Uh, we're absolutely thrilled that there's been great momentum growing. So uh, just in the past couple of months, we surpassed having 150,000 patient experience records uh, in the national database, and that's growing rapidly. What this map shows is uh, where the countries are in terms of coverage. Um, so Ontario has partial coverage, um, Nova Scotia is planning to submit, New Brunswick has uh, complete submission in, Manitoba has complete submission in, Alberta does as well, BC is on the path to getting data in, and then there's a star in each of the other provinces that have indicated an interest in joining. So you can see we have most of the country covered and uh, our goal over the next couple of years is to get everyone who isn't interested, interested, and ideally get almost all these jurisdictions submitting data in. Um, because again, that many, there's so much healthcare going on across Canada and with this 
uh, rigorously developed survey, you can really start to understand how well the system's working. Excuse me, Greg? Yes. Uh, over here. Um, this is just for inpatient? Yes, it is, yes. What about for outpatient? Because so much surgery is now outpatient. Do you track that? Do you have any outpatient surgery at this point? Um, but um, it's that huge. is... It's huge. Yep. 100% agree, and as are many other sectors in the system, and we would like to see it grow, uh, but it's largely driven by um, the provinces and territories in terms of their readiness to collect the data and which sectors they would like to start with next. Um, and you'll see at the end of this section where the next group we're looking at is long-term care, but there's also opportunities um, if there's enough interest across the, the country to do emergency department, home care, and uh, get all the key sectors. Uh, but that will definitely take some time and resources. That's one of the rate limiting uh, steps in all of this. Thank you. Uh, so what do we do with all of this data? So there's really two types of reporting. The first that we do, especially when the data is new, is we give the data back to the people that are sending it to us and give them comparisons that they can do locally to understand their data and make sure it's high enough quality. So this is what we, this is what we call our private reporting products and we have a comparative results tool that supports that. Uh, it's just been launched uh, about a year ago and uh, it's, as more data, as the data comes in, it gets uploaded into this, and that's a way of rewarding facilities for sending the data in, is they can see their data compared to their peers, and the sooner they get their data in, the sooner they can do their comparisons. So that serves as a real as catalyst to, for them to get their data in. This just shows some screenshots for the private reporting tool. But one of our key objectives of having all this data is also to report it publicly. <coughs> and the way we start with this is, um, is first doing a high level report that doesn't do facility or provincial and territorial comparisons, but just describes the data. So what are the general patient experiences uh, across Canada for acute care with the data that we have available? Um, but as you can see from this, um, from this chart, so we in spring of 2019, so just a few months away, we're planning to release our first summary report on the patient experience data. Um, but by the fall of next year or the year after, what we want to start doing uh, is uh, reporting at the facility or the region level publicly on our public reporting tools. And this is a, very similar to what we already do on a number of indicators for hospitals across the country. We have a tool called Your Health System, um, and that's a tool, a uh, public website that anyone across Canada or internationally can go on the internet and look up a range of indicators on how the health, how your health care system is working. And it has some functionality so you can pick and choose which hospitals you look at and which hospitals you want to compare with. Uh, it's used by thousands of people every year across the country, and what we see is adding some of this PREMS data into that, uh, that tool going forward. So we're, we're very excited about it and the momentum's really growing on the, on the PREMS data. So we had a question about other sectors. Um, so we know in certain parts of the country, emergency department PREMS are being captured. We've also uh, heard from stakeholders, there's a lot of interest in capturing PREMS data in long-term care settings. Uh, and there are some tools available. Um, so what we're doing this year is a bit of an, a business case development to see what would it take to do uh, in long-term care what we are now doing in, acute, in the inpatient side. And again, that'll be partly driven by stakeholder readiness and the willingness of people to collect the data uh, because that's obviously, um, we don't want to add more burden to the system if there isn't value coming out of it. So that's what's happening on the PREMS front, and when I finish up with the slides uh, in a few minutes, we can then talk, uh, open to questions on the PREMS, the PROMS, or, or any questions you may have around uh, what Kai Hai can bring to the table or what we've learned through these experiences. 
And I'll now just uh, switch gears and focus on the PROMS, the patient reported outcome measures. <clears throat> okay, so similar to PREMS, but um, a few years after the momentum for PREMS started building, uh, there was a lot of interest and buzz, uh, so to speak, about PROMS. Uh, being able to inform uh, the healthcare system and perhaps support a more patient-centered uh, healthcare system as well because it brings in the patient's perspective into outcomes, whether or not people are truly getting better um, in their functioning, their, their pain, and also their quality of life. And that's really what PROMS is, are set up to, to get at. Um, so a lot of interest or a lot of buzz but there was a lack of clarity in terms of w uh, where they can be valuable and where to start. So Kaihai did uh, something that we're very well set up to do, which is we convened a group of stakeholders to talk about the issue uh, and find out what was most important for them in terms of proms and what was the readiness to start collecting new data. Because what we don't want to do is go off and build an expensive data collection system and not have anyone submit data to it. Because that's uh, a major opportunity cost and not a good use of, of taxpayers' money by any stretch. Uh, so we've sort of taken incremental steps with this. Uh, the focus on our PROMS programs, quite similar to the PREMS and other things that Kaihai does. So we focus on standards development. So getting similar data collected in according to standardized measures, um, using com comparative reporting, both public and private, for PROMS, also looking at how can we support innovative data collection um, so that it doesn't, it can be easy for patients to complete their PROMS and doesn't have to go through a doctor's office or a hospital administrative uh, unit to get the data collected because that's less efficient for everybody making sure alignment and stakeholder priorities, and then picking the clinical areas that would be best suited to start on with PROMS. So you remember I said with PROMS, there's a, they're best suited for conditions where you would expect a benefit from the healthcare intervention. So hip and knee replacements is a relatively easy one because there's a very clear benefit that's expected. Uh, when For chronic conditions or um, yeah, for, for chronic conditions in particular, you don't necessarily expect people to get better over time, but you would like their quality of life to be as good as it could, as possibly can be. Uh, <clears throat> so it's a little trickier in terms of how to use PROMS for patients that have chronic conditions or conditions that uh, do get worse over time. So hip and knee replacements I'll focus on in a minute because we've got the most concrete evidence there. But we also did want to look at chronic renal care. So Kaihai runs the dialysis registry across Canada. And we know those are very, really important patient populations. Um, they often don't have good outcomes over time. Uh, but there are problems out there that can help clinicians intervene earlier and symptom management, which can help with patient experience, but also their long-term outcomes. So PROMS is a little more complicated than PREMS, uh, but we're making some good progress on it. <clears throat> so on the hip and knee side, I should also mention on for PROMS, Kaihai is not an expert in developing the PROMS instruments. However, there are hundreds of PROMS tools out there that have been validated by researchers and often are available for public use for a range of conditions. So what we did is we really sifted through the tools that could help with hip and knee replacements, identified the ones that we thought were best, and then worked with our stakeholders to choose just one or two of those to proceed with. Now with PROMS, there's two types of tools. One is called condition specific. So for hip and knee replacement, there are tools specifically for someone that has severe hip pain and limitations. So that's called the condition specific tool. And that helps that patient and their care provider know if they're getting the full benefit. But there's another very important type of PROM called a generic PROM. And generic PROMs can be used for any patients and they can be used for healthy populations. 
they're less specific for the condition, but what they're specifically designed for is to be able to quantify the improvement in quality of life. And this is important just for being able to measure that, but also economists have been able to apply a dollar value to that. And it's not necessarily the right dollar value, but what it allows um, the health system to do, and possibly also groups like yours, is um, to measure the amount of health benefit from different interventions within patient groups, but also across different patient populations. So it can help um, decision makers decide, is there more health to be gained by investing, say, in chronic renal care uh, versus cardiac care? And how do you get the balance right from a patient's perspective? And that's where generic PROMs can come in. Um, the other piece is around minimum data sets. So in addition to the PROM, you also need some demographic information. And then you need adoption of these standards. So you need people to agree to collect them. And then there's international comparisons come into play as well for PREMs and PROMs. So I'll just give a bit more detail on this. So this screen just shows uh, a generic PROM. So this is a European tool, but it's five questions. Um, it takes literally you know, under a minute to complete. If we can build this in, so if a number of your groups, for example, were to uh, be very interested in collecting PROMs, your, your group specifically may want the condition specific, but there may be some added benefit if you also include a generic PROM so you can compare uh, with other disease conditions as well. Um, so very simple to complete. What's essential with PROMs and PREMs is it is completed by the patient and ideally in a way that they don't feel biased to say nice things. It should be their true heartfelt responses. So nothing against surgeons here, but perhaps you don't want, you know, a hip replacement patient completing their prom with their surgeon <laughs> looking over their shoulder. Um, uh, this question here is just an example on the hip replacement. Again, very simple questions like, how would you describe the pain you usually have from your hip? None, very mild, mild, moderate, or severe. Um, during the past four weeks, have you had any trouble washing or drying yourself because of your hip? So you can see these kinds of questions get at people's daily activities and functioning in a way that clinical measures will never get at. And it's one of the reasons that we believe PROMs are, are very important to having a comprehensive picture of the healthcare system. What this chart shows is just an example in, in England, how they're reporting on PROMs um, for hip replace. This graph shows hip replacements. And whoops, let me just go back here. So this is reported at the trust level. So that's basically at a, a large hospital level in England. And they publicly report the, prem, the PROMs improvement measures for hip replacement patients. Uh, and they show the national average as well. So the three trusts that are reported here, or the trust that's reported here, uh, according to the Oxford HIP score, so that was the condition specific, and the EQ5D, which is the generic, uh, both trusts are a little bit lower than the national average, but they're within statistical probability. They're not significantly different from the national average. So they're inside that green bar if they were outside the green bar at either end, they would be st statistically significantly higher or lower than the national average. So in England, uh, where they do have, um, some people would use this to decide which hospital they would go to to get their hip replacement. So that's one use of PROMs. Um, two things that we know from the evidence where PREMs and PROMs really aren't well suited for use is payment for performance. Um, there's too much subjectivity that can get introduced and, and other issues. Uh, it can be used as one factor, but it, the general thinking is uh, it should not be used as the sole factor. But still, this can really drive performance. And we know clinical teams, when they see these publicly or privately, they have a lot of pride. They want to be high performers. So when they see their, their colleagues across the city maybe doing a little bit better on their PREMs and PROMs, 
it will help them raise their game. And what we see over time is everybody gets better through this type of public reporting. <clears throat> so I'll just take a couple of minutes in Ontario. Um, they've taken a big step to uh, fund Chi High and Cancer Care Ontario to support uh, hip and knee replacement proms collection. Uh, and this is the first province that's decided to do that. And uh, Alberta also does it for their hip and um, their bone and joint institute as well. So I shouldn't say Ontario is the only one, but Ontario is the one that Kai High is involved in right now. Um, so that project's just been just ramping up now. And how we're setting it up is Kai High sets the, the national standards for hip and knee replacement proms because we run the Canadian Joint Replacement Registry. Cancer Care Ontario has, as many of you may know, they have an existing tool for cancer proms um, called the Isaac tool that collects um, symptom management uh, for cancer patients. So rather than set up a complete parallel system, what's happening in Ontario is Cancer Care Ontario is extending that service for the hip and knee replacement proms collection. So that can be a very efficient model for people that are coming into healthcare facilities to, to collect those problems. The real-time information gets shared back to the surgeons so they can inform their clinical decision-making. And then the data also comes to Kai High, and we will do the comparative reporting and public reporting on it and share it back with the ministry. So we're very excited about that. <clears throat> and I think I've... Oh, one other thing, I mentioned international comparisons. So there's an organization called the OECD, which is uh, an international organization of, of peer countries. So we've got England, Australia, New Zealand, the US, a lot of European countries in there, Japan as well. And these countries cooperate on sharing data on economics, on health, and within the health space, um, we're looking at uh, hip and knee replacement proms. And also, earlier this morning, there's a group that's just gotten started focused on mental health proms. Um, the tools and data collection methods aren't as well developed yet, but the fact that there's international interest, uh, I think that could help in this area in Canada as well. So that's the OECD uh, work on proms, and Kai High's plugged into that. Um, I mentioned these other conditions as well. Uh, so I won't touch on those now, but there is some work going on in cancer-related proms uh, through um, the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer. And then on our website, there's a bit of an overview document on PREMS and PROMS, and more things you can uh, get access to on our website. The links are there. I won't go through all the details. And then just to, to wrap up, um, everything that Kai High does is really, it's for the health system for a range of stakeholders in the healthcare system. So we're happy to collaborate on national projects to advance PREMS and PROMS or, or other uses of our data. Uh, we welcome those opportunities. Um, what we do have is constraints, just like everybody in terms of how many people we have available to work on things and funding. And then the other thing, because we are national in scope, it's harder for us to take on projects that are just in one region or one province. We usually wait until there's enough momentum in two or three provinces where they agree to do the same thing the same way. It doesn't have to be everybody. Um, so that just gives you a bit of context for how Kai High works. Um, and I think that's, yes. Okay, so we'll open it up for questions, mm -hmm. suggestions, comments. Hi, Greg. Thank you so much for the great presentation. Um, just wondering, it, yesterday Rod Burns was here uh, from the Alliance of Healthier Communities and mentioned um, work that, been, that they've been doing with Kai High around uh, primary care, sort of EMR standards, and yes. um, I know it's one of the data gaps currently. Um, and just wondering, are, is there... Uh, are there timelines for, for um, well, primary care specifically, but you know, I know it's an ongoing process to try to get all of the data um, nationally, but I know primary care is one of those big black holes. Um, others have maybe more geographic uh, holes to fill, mm -hmm. but any thoughts on sort of timelines and, and future looking plans to try to fill some of those data 
data gaps? No, I think it's, uh, thank you for the question. Um, we would like them filled yesterday, to be honest with you. Um, and as the country has moved on to electronic medical records, um, there's a lot, there's a very rich source of data in those. Um, but I, I would say when they were first put in place, there wasn't enough, in my opinion, there wasn't enough attention to getting some of the basic data standards in place so that useful data could be easily extracted from all those EMRs given what a rich source they are. Um, so we're actually later this month hosting a forum with some federal and provincial territorial representatives to try and get further buy-in for a minimum data set of standards that they will push to have included in the EMRs going forward. Now that has to be done obviously in close consultation with physicians and family medicine teams because it could affect how many patients they could see in a day if they're asked to complete too many data fields. So getting the balance right there is, is key and also working with the vendors that develop these, uh, these tools. Uh, but we are um, through, as Rod uh, likely mentioned, they're now through this, the CHCs across in Ontario, but also soon across Canada, there'll be a lot of primary care data available. And our early analysis of that shows it can be quite useful for a number of measures. What those tools don't have today, though, are PREMs and PROMs. Um, and it may be a good point to get even baseline PROMs for people that are very early in their disease trajectory um, so that over time, as they touch different points of the healthcare system, you can start to get a more complete picture. And for chronic conditions, I think those repeated measures is, is most important. It doesn't have to be every visit though. It could be once a year or once every six months. And Alberta's taking an approach like that where they're like the EQ5D generic tool. They're trying to maximize completion of that whenever someone enters the healthcare system. And then with sophisticated statistical modeling, they can really get a better understanding of the picture, including primary care. Thank you for the presentation. Um, so I have two uh, two questions, and one the first question is expectation, patient expectations before when they go into um, a healthcare setting. How is that captured in Prima Prom? Because um, experience and outcome are slightly different than the uh, and then what, uh, than, than the patient expectation. And my second question <coughs> is: um, Are there opportunity for patient organizations that are of a national scope to work with Kai Hai to to do some of these data collecting? Um, rather than working just with the government agencies. Thank you. Yes, so patient expectations, I, it's a great question. Uh, I don't think there's anything in the PREM survey about the patient's expectations, but presume, I think that the questions have been researched to an extent that if someone's reporting a poor experience and some of the questions may get at, ex at expectations specifically, um, it can be inferred that their expectations weren't met. Um, and with the hip and knee replacements, uh, one of the questions that we're considering adding is actually, um, you know, six, six months or a year after surgery, in addition to doing the prom, just a global question as to whether or not they thought, felt their expectations were met. Um, the surgeons welcome this as well, um, because often people may not have realistic expectations about the amount of improvement from certain interventions. And that's where even having a baseline PROMS can be helpful where the, the for hip and knee replacement example, the surgeon and the patient can talk and say, given where you are today, you can, ex and looking at Canadian data, you can expect this much improvement. Um, you know, you may be able to jog, but you won't be able to go downhill skiing. And then after a year, the patient's less likely to be dissatisfied because they've got, had a realistic expectation going in. Some patients may also decide, given the amount of benefit they're going to get, depending where they are on severity, they may choose not to have the surgery. I mean, they could focus on some other way to reduce pain and have the surgery later. In terms of working with Kaya, yes, I think we're, we're open. Um, we are interested in talking with groups and having discussions um, and participating in ways that you would find valuable. 
um, you know, with resource availability. I hate to say that, but it's just one of those factors, yeah. Uh, oh, and sorry, your have, other, about I, oh. groups collecting data, yes. I think groups like yours could help enable data collection because PREMS and PROMS don't need to be collected by the healthcare providers. It just, it just needs to be collected by patients and made as easy as possible. Patient portals could be a great powerful tool in the future. Smartphones, if it's secure, uh, might be a way to do it. Yeah. Um, thanks so much for that, Greg. And uh, it's wonderful that we at least have the start of uh, a national opportunity to gather data in the public sector. Um, you mentioned OECD, and OECD as well as the World Economic Forum, neither of which I think you would agree are exactly revolutionary organizations, sure. um, have both endorsed the concept of value-based health care based on patient reported outcomes. And you've mentioned, as you just did, um, your interest in engagement. So, uh, so, and of course you have some gaps. Uh, mm -hmm. But one of the things that we've been hearing over the last two days, at least I've been hearing, I don't know if everybody else heard it, is that even the ICHOM uh, patient reported outcomes, uh, I think Andre may be gone now, Andre Diaz, but he, yes confessed publicly that even there they recognize that they have not had enough patient engagement in actually determining what are the real outcomes that patients want mm -hmm. and what they really value. Okay. So this is an area that we've been kind of bumping around the last couple of days as something that we might consider as we don't do pilot projects, but we do catalyst projects. Mm -hmm. So um, as a catalyst project that perhaps some of us who are interested as patient groups could take the lead to develop. And I'm wondering if that makes any sense at all to you, and if it were, if that's an area, given resources, <laughs> um, that might be a good, you know, partnership uh, with Kai Hai and, of course, others. Yes. No, I think it's, um, I think it does provide a, it is an important area to focus on. Um, and it may be that having the patient groups go through the existing tools, you may find some that you think actually work quite well. <clears throat> if you're going to develop your own tool, and that may be the decision in the end that that is the best way to go. Uh, it does take some time to do that. Um, and it wouldn't be Kai highs we could be at the table and provide advice where it's helpful. Uh, but it wouldn't be our area of expertise. I think that would actually be like measurement researchers. It's a very specific group of, of people and they love these tools and how they measure and what it doesn't measure. And, uh, but having some of them at the table because they can help you get the right tool to measure the right things. Um, there is also quite a, it's, it's an evolving field too where in the old days, well, most of the tools available were to help prove the benefit of certain drugs or interventions. But increasingly, people are recognizing that the PROMs should focus more on functioning, pain, quality of life, and a lot of the questions in each tool can be asked to any patient, in, including healthy ones. So I think it's probably a good time to, to weigh in on that and help shape the field for the future. Yep. Hi. Uh, thanks uh, very much for an excellent presentation on uh, Kai Hai and your uh, patient reported outcomes and so forth. Um, having played a small role uh, in the colorectal cancer subset uh, of ICHOM, um, which actually were developed with an Australian group, which uh, I'm proud to say is linked with us, uh, I was wondering if Kai Hai is going to play um, or do any further work in patient reported outcomes in oncology in Canada. Uh, that's the first question, uh, without being specific to colorectal yes. <laughs> in particular. Uh, the second thing is, um, in, uh, in the development of real-world evidence and the use of it in uh, various research and in, uh, including the drug approval process, I was wondering if Kai Hai is uh, looking at ways to integrate their data with other data banks, ISIS, et cetera, ICES, I should say, yes. et cetera. Yeah. Oh, great questions, and thank you for those. Um, so in the, um, 
in the cancer space, um, we, ha we don't have current plans. What we've decided to do is um, the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer is doing a lot of work on PREMS and PROMS. Um, but I think there's great momentum there. There could be great value in having that data linked to some of the CHI-HI data, um, both for experience but also the other clinical measures. Um, but we do, we haven't met for a, recently with uh, CPAC about their PREMS and PROMS activities, but in recent years, we met with them on a regular basis to try and ensure some coordination. Uh, and sorry, I missed your second question. Sorry, the, the question is uh, on linking databases uh, with other data banks uh, for the purposes of gathering real world evidence and data. Oh yes, thank you, yeah. So we do link, um, we're the one organization in Canada right now that can link data from across all jurisdictions. So we do, we link it for our own analysis, but also to make it available to researchers, uh, including with ICES and uh, Manitoba Center and others. So we're very, uh, positive on that. We think that that's the way to go is uh, one of our internal models is collect once, use many times um, because we think most of the data that's needed is out there. It's just a matter of connecting it up in a privacy sensitive manner and making it available. Um, so yes, we'll really believe that's the way to go. Great. Sorry, and I, I apologize in advance. If you covered this in your presentation, I did step out for two minutes. But I was wondering if you could comment on the PREMS and the PROMS and how the data from that collection activity is being used. So I guess the feedback loop. Yes, yeah. So that's all the, um, the private reporting tools. So submitting centers get their data through private reporting and then we'll also do public reporting. And as we get more data in, we'll also start to connect it with the other, uh, the clinical data that's available, uh, both clinical and the costing data, which really starts to connect the dots for the value-based care circle. Yeah. And it's not just us who will use it, it's, uh, it's a public resource, yeah. Do you know what In terms of the use of the tools or? Uh, I would say on the PREMS front, um, I don't know the numbers exactly, but for the jurisdictions that are submitting data, they're all, they were, chomping at the bit, so to speak, for us to get the private reporting tool ready for them. Uh, and everyone, once they submit their data, they're all using it to compare themselves over time and also with their peers, either within jurisdiction or others. Yeah. The PROMS data, we don't have enough yet to know the uptake, but I suspect it'll be, should be equally strong. Yeah. Great, well, thank you very much. Thank you very much.